My name is Christian Novak, a representative of the Military Education Preservation Project, and I am at the home of Lynn Gallucci on this day, July 31st, 2020, talking to Mr. Gallucci about his time in the service. Mr. Gallucci, can you start by giving us some background information on yourself, starting with where you were born? I was born on February 2nd, 1923, in Montclair, New Jersey, to my parents, Tony and Mary Ann Gallucci. Uh, my name is Ronaldo Ralph Gallucci, and uh, probably wondering how I was called Len, uh, but the reason I received the name Len was we were living in Montclair, and we had lived on the first and second floors, and a couple by the name of Tony Tedesco and Josephine lived upstairs. He was a musician and he worked nights. And during the day, he and his wife would take me with them wherever they went because my mother was quite sickly. And the reason my mother was quite sickly was my brother Joe was killed by a train when I was about four years old, which devastated the family, especially my mother. And they got to calling me Little Len and and Tony, uh, Len, Tedesco, Big Len, and that's where I got the name Len from. I graduated from Montclair High and was pretty high in my class. I can't remember the exact position. And when I graduated, I went to work for the a &P Tea Company, which is a supermarket, and uh, was there until I uh, enlisted in the Army. And in 1942, I enlisted in the Army Air Force and was given a deferment because they had too many uh, applications and couldn't accept everybody at once. And I was given another uh, deferment and in the early part of 43, and I, and I should tell this story, I worked for the draft board, but not in the main office. I worked at the hospital in Glenridge, New Jersey, Mountainside Hospital, and I typed up the forms uh, that these young men who were being drafted had to answer all the questions. Now, I was working for the FBI, and I got $1 a year for working for them, and, uh, but I was under the penalty if I revealed any of the information that these young men gave me, I would be uh, tried in court and sentenced to uh, several years or 10 years, I can't remember, in uh, Levensworth. Um, when I got the deferment in 43, I called Betty, a former classmate of mine, who was working in the main office. Now, I never was in the main office. And Betty says, Len, you should have been gone long ago. And so she says, let me check on something, and I'll call you back. And she checked, and she called, and she says, Len, something strange has happened, and we're going to draft you immediately, because we found a file on the bottom of the cabinet what 100 names in it. I can't re tell you the names of them, but we don't know who did it. And so we're drafting all of it. And 100 men went into the service because I made a phone call to the draft board. Uh, I entered the service on April 1st, 1943. And we went to Fort Dix for our induction. And while in Fort Dix, a friend of mine who lived up the street from me was a first sergeant there, and he gave me a, a shirt with his rank on it. And he said, take this shirt and wear it, but don't use it whenever you're in transit, and just hang it on the end of your bed, and when they come around looking for KP duty, they'll spot the sergeant's shirt and it won't bother you. But it kind of backfired on me later on. Uh, 
He also told me to memorize the as much of the uh, army manual as I could, and anything that the manual says I could live by. And we were sent from uh, Fort Dix down to Miami. Now I can't remember if this is situation took place in Fort Dix or Miami, but all the men were taken to a, a building and were given haircuts and they were shaving their heads off completely. And when I got to my turn, I put my 50 cents on the table and I asked the barber where his barber shop was. And I says, and he told me, and I says, what time you open up? And he told me, and it was on a Saturday, and I went, uh, well, the haircuts were on Friday, but on a Saturday was when I was able to go to his uh, barber shop. And I told him to cut my hair no more, and it couldn't, none of the hair could be any longer than two inches. And of course, Monday morning, when we were standing at attention, <laughs> and the sergeant looked at me and he said, how come you didn't get a haircut? And I said, sir, I did get a haircut. According to the manual, on page so-and-so, and paragraph so-and-so, which I had memorized, airman's hair cannot be any longer than two inches. And if you can find any hair on my head that's two inches, over two inches long, I'll have it shaved off. And he started giving me a hard time, and I asked to see my CO. And when I went to the CO, and I'd report to him and, and quoted the paragraph, and he looked at me and he looked at the sergeant and he said, Sergeant, after he checked the manual himself, he's got you, just leave him alone. <laughs> and that was <laughs> one of the funny incidents that happened there. And when we were at basic training in Miami Beach, Florida, uh, we lived in the hotels, but uh, we had no room service. They had stopped that two weeks before we had got there. And we used to march up and down the streets of Miami Beach singing at sometimes at six o'clock in the morning and there was a woman there that wrote a letter to President Roosevelt complaining about our singing and marching and he wrote a letter back to her which we were told about that which he preferred to have the, the boots of the Nazis marching up down the street or our young men, and that was the end of that. Uh, <laughs> another funny incident that happened there is we had a, a fire drill, and when you have the fire drill, whatever you're doing, you have to leave immediately and go down. I was taking a shower, and so I just pulled the curtain and hoped that nobody would check. But unfortunately, the lieutenant pulled the curtain back when he checked my room and ordered me out. And I said, I have no clothes. He says, just grab a towel. And I grabbed the towel and went down and said, the towel didn't last long with all the guys around me. And that was an embarrassment. Uh, from Miami Beach, we went to, I was sent to Gulfport, Mississippi to uh, me mechanical and electrical uh, school for aircraft. And... Uh, <laughs> The first day of our arrival there was was uh, kind of strange. We had been used to marching and singing, and and uh, with a a, uh, a a band playing, and here we came hitting the streets of Gulfport, Mississippi, uh, uh, airport, with uh, singing and marching. You can imagine, 600 men marching through and singing, and the doors on the barracks flew open, and when we passed the headquarters, all the officers came out. And the following day, they put out orders that from now on, all the students that were in school would be marching and singing, and there'd be a, a award given to the one that marched the best and sang the best and you would get a, a three-day pass. Hmm. And a, 
course, we were in Squadron C, and the whole, so used to marching because of our training that we almost went over every uh, month. While there at, at Amarillo in school, just before graduation, I had an attack, an attack of appendicitis, and it happened during the evening, and my buddies carried my bed out and put it alongside the street because they had called for uh, an ambulance to come and pick me up. Well, evidently, the ambulance didn't come because uh, I think it was around uh, 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning when an officer came by and he asked me what I was doing sleeping outside. And I told him what was happening. And, and of course, he got an ambulance there real quick. And I was taken there. And fortunately for me, they got me there in time because as the doctor took my appendix out, it burst in his hand, and which probably saved my life. After I got out of the hospital, they gave me a medical furlough, and I was in the headquarters with this uh, furlough papers in my hand, and then walked the sergeant, and he says, I'm looking for Ronaldo Ralph Gallucci. And I said, that's me. He says, you are on shipment. I said, wait a minute, I just got a furlough to go home. I just had my appendix taken out. And he smiled, he said, sorry, and he grabbed the papers out of my hand before I could do anything. And the next thing I know, I was being shipped to St. Louis, Missouri, to Washington University for uh, training as a cadet. And uh, uh, it was rather unfortunate because I sh hadn't been home in quite a while, uh, well, I'd never had a furlough before. And my folks were kind of wondering why I wasn't coming home. And it was an experience though. Life as a lower classman at the uh, universities was kind of rough because they could, uh, the upper classmen could ask you questions or make you do things that uh, you didn't want to do or, or were not embarrassing or anything that was uh, unlawful, but some of the fellows had to push a peanut or a pencil across the floor with their nose and spit water into a basket to put out a fire. Uh, I can't remember if I did that or not, to tell the truth, so I can't, I won't say that. But, uh, or they would ask a question like, uh, j jump, or when you came down, why did you come down? Nobody ordered you to come down, and, and you get a a gig for everything that you did wrong and of course with each gig you had to do to march and uh, for an hour for each gig that was over seven and while there at Washington University I don't know why we did it but six men that were in the room with me we decided to really clean the room up and we scrubbed the fireplace down get all the soot off it and it, the room was spotless, and I was in charge of the room. And if any gigs go to a room, they would be applied to the person in charge. And this officer came in, and he was inspecting our room. He looked around, and he put his finger on the mirror, and of course, I left the fingerprint. And he walked around the room again and looked. At, oh, fingerprint on the mirror, one gig. And of course, that put me over to seven gigs and I would have to march on my day off. And uh, I said to him, sir, that's your fingerprint. He says, two gigs for talking when you're not supposed to. And so then I requested to see my CO and I went down to the CO and did all the oblight movements I'm supposed to do and did everything properly, including the, uh, he was a captain and but I dropped my salute before he did. So he said, well, he says, that's another gig. <laughs> so there I had three gigs now, and that meant I had to march for three hours with a, a full pack on my back and a rifle. And when Saturday came and our time to go on our leave for the weekend, 
I had to march, but my friend of mine was in charge as officer of the day. And he said, when the CO left, he would let me go. And so he, he did. And I walked down to the, uh, where the streetcars, they had streetcars in St. Louis at that time. And I got on the streetcar and I walked back. And the only seat that was available, and I didn't look for her, I would have walked off the streetcar. I sat down, I looked, I could see the officers uh, uh, close, and I looked at him and he says, how did you get here? I said, I put all my gigs in a row and walked here. And he said, well, you'll be doing them when you get back. Have a good time. <laughs> and that was unusual because they could have really been rough on me. We were unfortunate. Uh, to have enlisted at the time we did or go, been sent to Washington University at the time we did because when they, the Air Force had too many pilots and didn't need the men anymore. And in fact, they were bringing in women to do, do the flying of the planes from the United States to Europe. And uh, so 36,000 of us got washed out at the same time and were sent to different schools. I was sent to Amarillo, Texas, to a mechanical school and electrical uh, maintenance of aircraft. And I made the unfortunate mistake of getting to higher grades going through school. And the day that of our graduation, all the fellows that were going to be a uh, flight crew were assigned to the different aircraft. And when it came to three of us, a number of fellows, it was uh, Merch and Fitzpatrick and myself, uh, we were told we were becoming instructors. And I got upset and so did the Merch and Fitzpatrick. And we went AWOL. And we were AWOL for several days. And we came back. The, our CEO looked at us and says, are you okay now? He says, you ready to go to work? And so we did. And we were put into a session of training for to become instructors. And we, uh, as an instructor, uh, when we graduated that phase of the school, we were the highest ranking officer in the class. And one of the funny incidents that happened to, while well, I was an, an instructor, I had a class of officers come in and they all wore fatigue, so I didn't know who was who or what rank they were. And uh, I had their names, but no rank. And uh, I, the man that was a full colonel, I had him washing the blackboard and the second lieutenant, uh, I had, had him sweeping the floor and he refused. And the, the colonel pulled back his fatigues and showed his, uh, his rank and said, if you don't do what he tells you, I will have you on report. And so of course the second lieutenant had to do the work. Uh, after graduating uh, from that instructor school, and I mean, he didn't graduate, I became uh, in charge of electrical maintenance in an odd way. Uh, we got a call when I was sitting in the office and the commander of the field, and I'm trying to think of the name, his, I think it was Kennedy, but General Kennedy, but I'm not sure. And he uh, wanted three men to be transferred to uh, uh, the electrical maintenance and and so I said does it matter who they are he says no so I gave my na I gave my name his pastor and Merch's name and we were all transferred and then uh, they were trying to bring up a court martial against me for impersonating an officer because I had answered the phone but I never said who I was never gave rank, never gave my name, except to be transferred. 
so that it was dropped, unfortunately. Another incident happened that while I was in charge of the electrical maintenance, uh, was I was on a three-day pass and I came back to the base and the MPs looked at me and says, when I told them who I was, they questioned me and they put me in a Jeep and took me up to the flight line and there was a fighter plane with all the skin drawn uh, taken off around the engine and they couldn't get it started and so I said to them did anybody check the circuit breaker and they looked at me as if I was some weird guy what's a circuit breaker I said there's a little red button down alongside of the the throttle uh, handle and so they reached down there and they reset the circuit brake and the engine started and so I, I told the pilot after we put all the skin back on the plane told the pilot to go up and do some maneuvers and see if everything was all right and he did all kinds of maneuvers and, and it was working fine and so we calculated the speed of the squadron that he belonged to and uh, how many minutes they had left before him and uh, in fact it was about a half hour or better <laughs> uh, so and told him to travel at such a speed and he would overtake his squadron but whether he did or not I do not know I was given a chance to sign up for China Burma India to uh, uh, fly there and uh, give them a delay in route and I went home for 11 days and uh, the day I was about to leave to go back I told my dad look I'm going to China Burma India I don't know if I'll ever come back and I said why don't you sell the car because at that time he could get a real good price for his car well he sold the car the, day, the same day I left after just putting an ad in the paper and uh, uh, got a good price for it. When I got back to the field, I asked the MP to, for, to take me with the Jeep up to the flight line to, so that I can join my crew. And he said, the MP looked at me and says, when I told him my name, he says, I'm sorry, but you better go back to your squatter. You're not going. And I said, what do you mean I'm not going? I said, I just came back from a delay in route. He said, you'll see when you get back to your headquarters. So I went back, and there on the bulletin board was a big black line right through my name and the word essential written alongside of it. And so I went in to see my CO, and he says, we need you here, Len. We need you with your expertise and your, your knowledge of electrical maintenance to stay here. I was court-martialed two times. The first time I was court-martialed was I came back from, from a, uh, a weekend pass. I, there was a, a soldier with a rifle in front of my barracks and he says, when I told him who I was, he questioned me, of course, and he says, you're under arrest. So he says, you can stay in the barracks, but you cannot come out. And let, just when you go to for to eat and we'll go with you and so I picked up the phone and called my adjutant and uh, asked him what was the problem and he says well he says you're under arrest because you falsified your report when you enlisted in the service he said first of all you you you, you signed up as Ronaldo Gallucci and your name is Ronaldo Ralph Gallucci. And, uh, and he says, and another thing you said, you had no relatives that were officers in the foreign uh, army, and, uh, or enemy army, I should say. And lo and behold, your uncle is a general in the Italian Air Force. And I said, well, I didn't know that. And he said, what you want to do is write a letter to your dad and explaining everything to him and have him write a letter back explaining why your, your name is Ronaldo Ralph Gallucci and why who your uncle is and so I sent the letter to my dad and when it came back 
when I received it, it was opened already, and someone else already had uh, checked it out. But my dad says, the reason why you have another name, Ralph, is when you were baptized as a Catholic, uh, your Uncle Ralph was your godfather, and you take your godfather's name for Ralph. He says, as far as your uncle being a general, he says, I don't know. He says, because even the police over there were, were uh, military off, uh, uniforms. And uh, he says, I, I will write to your uncle and find out. But uh, when I got in front of the court martial and explained what my dad said, and of course they had already read it, and it was dismissed. The second court martial was, I was working on the general of the field, the General Kennedy, I believe it was, air aircraft. And we had to disconnect the wing flap in order to crawl into the wing and to uh, check out the electrical units in there. Uh, and of course, when I, we were working, in, the war was over already by this time. And uh, we were working only eight hour shifts. So when I left my ship, I put the plane on a red X in two different spots. And when I got back to my barracks that time, again, I was under uh, arrest. And I called my adjutant and he says, uh, the reason you're under arrest is that General Kennedy was taking some friends up for a flight. It was a converted B-29 made into a plush uh, uh, bedrooms and bar and so forth. And uh, uh, when he was taxing down, he checked his wing flap for some reason or the other, and the wing collapsed. And if he had been flying, the plane would have crashed and they'd probably been killed. And so I was under arrest for that and so I told the adjutant wait a minute I said when I left I put the uh, plane on a red X in two different spots somebody had to clear it he said just don't say anything to anybody until you get before the uh, the marshal board and when I got there I the uh, a colonel was in charge and I looked at him and I explained to him about the Red X. And of course, they had the papers and they looked. And sure enough, there was the Red X with my initials alongside. It, and nobody had cleared it. So that cleared me. But the entire maintenance crew that worked on that aircraft were transferred immediately off the field because somebody was trying to get rid of the, the, uh, the general. And I wound up going to Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, which was a beautiful field with dispersed uh, plane f features where the planes were scattered all over the place. And uh, but a funny thing happened when I got there. I got there at midnight, and there was no way of getting transportation out to the field. So I was walking, which was a 12-mile walk, and. Here come this car, car along, and I, I flagged it down, seeing if I could get a ride. And lo and behold, it was a sheriff. And instead of taking me to the airfield, he took me back to Wilmington, and uh, I was putting in with the drunks and all the, <laughs> the riffraff, and they wouldn't let me make a phone call to the base. And I tried to show them my uh, shipment papers, and I had just got in. I really refused to look at him. And the next morning, uh, when the new crew came on, they allowed me to make a phone call. When I called out there, my CO came right in. I didn't even know who he was, but it was Captain Green. And he came in to get me. And he really chewed him out for not letting me go to the base. I was immediately put in charge of electrical maintenance on the aircraft. And as a dispersed field, we were uh, we were working on a, a B-29, and it was quite a ways away from our squadron. And so we were at a different mess hall, 
and I saw this mess hall there, and I said, well, let's, rather than drive all the way back to our mess hall, let's go eat here. And I made a mistake. It was a basic training mess hall. And we went in, and there was a big sign like it had in all the mess hall, take all you want, but eat all you take. And my buddy and I got our food, sat down, I took one taste of it. No, it was horrible. And uh, I said, don't say anything. I said, this must be a basic training class. Let's just go dump our trays and get out of here. Well, we went to dump our trays and the sergeant grabbed my arm and says, what are you doing? I says, uh, just getting rid of this stuff. He said, you're going to eat it. I said, sir, if you eat it, I'll eat it. He refused to eat it. And so I asked permission to make a phone call, and I called uh, out to my adjutant, and he says, I'll be right there. And he came down, and I said, sir, and I told, explained to him what happened. I said, if you eat it, I'll eat it. And he took one taste of it, and he closed that mess hall down immediately because they received the same rations that our mess hall got, but whoever cooked it wasn't cooking it properly, and the poor kids had to eat it and uh, the whole place was scrubbed down and uh, they got decent food. Uh, another incident that happened there was Admiral Nedvins, uh landed there at his B-29 that was a converted plush deal and he was going to Paris and he asked to have his uh, plane checked and one of the checks was a battery and everybody was laughing. There's no batteries on a B-29. I says, yes, there is. And I, I says, well, if you think there's one on, how about putting them up a bed? I said, all right. And they all put up $20 a piece. There was three civilians. And I just put up $20 and gave it to my CEO and he was holding on. He was smiling because he figured, I said there was a battery there, it had to be a battery. Well, there was a battery on the plane, but not for use as they thought to start the engines that way. Instead, it, back in the, uh, the rear compartment, just before the uh, rear gunner's compartment, was a uh, little putt-putt, we call it. And you crank that up and started it, and uh, that gave them enough electricity to start an engine. And when I showed them that, of course, they lost their $20, and that was a thing. From Wilmington, Delaware, I was sent for Dick to Fort Dix for a discharge. And we were there for several weeks waiting for our discharge. And uh, one day, they called me and asked me to, uh, uh, well, before that, well, I was at Wilmington, Delaware waiting to be uh, put into the, my uh, in charge of electrical maintenance. I was in transit, so I hung that shirt up on the bed that I was talked about from the first sergeant in Fort Dix. And lo and behold, one morning here comes this fellow with a flashlight, waking everybody up. When he looked somehow or the other, he, his flashlight hit the sergeant's shirt. He said, sorry, Sarge, sorry, Sarge. Just go back to sleep. So I went back to sleep. But the next day, the first sergeant got sick. And uh, this young fellow who had, had come looking for KP duty for personnel said, don't worry about it, sir. We got another first sergeant in barrack so-and-so. And he said, we do? He said, not that I know. So he came in there and uh, <laughs> We all had to stand at attention, and the fellow pointed out to my bar, my bed, and said, "There she is, sir." And he looked at me. He says, uh, "Aglucci," he says, "Do you have a first sergeant shirt by any chance?" And so I told him yes, and I showed him. He says, "Do you ever wear it?" I said, "No, sir." He said, "Well, you're going to wear it today because you're a first sergeant for the day until our." Our first sergeant is better. <laughs> and I put that shirt on and wore it for a couple of days while the first sergeant got better. <laughs> but I could have been 
uh, in trouble, but he was, it was the same captain, Captain Green, that had befriended me once before, and he was pretty nice to us. Oh, uh, one other incident. While there, I was given guard duty uh, over prisoners, and I had 100 German prisoners, and I had a 45 with eight bullets in it. <laughs> you can imagine what would happen if they all jumped on me. I wouldn't even get a chance to pull the gun out. But they were uh, pretty nice guys, and I got to find out who the officer was in charge of those particular bunch of prisoners. And we had to uh, clean the officers' club. And I said, if you guys do a good job, I'll get you a hot meal. And they did, and I went to the mess hall with them, and the sergeant in charge was going to give them sandwiches. I said, no, sergeant, I pr promised them a hot meal if they did a good job. And he looked at me and was going to give me an argument. And for some reason, well, he changed his mind and served them a hot meal, and they were quite pleased by it. The next day, I was put in charge of 100 Italian prisoners of war. And again, I told the, the, the men, if they did a good job of cleaning, we were cleaning the COs, uh, 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 the non-commissioner officers, uh, headqu uh, not headquarters, but club. And if they did a good job, I'd get them a hot meal. And they, they did a perfect job and got them a hot meal. And, uh, and uh, the sergeant in charge of, of the uh, mess hall says, what else can we do for them? I said, well, they haven't had any uh, uh, fruit in weeks. He says, well, I got a crate of oranges they can have. So I gave them a crate. You've never seen a happier bunch of guys singing and, and as they march back to their uh, uh, barracks with a crate of oranges on their shoulders and uh, enjoying it. On February 9th, 1946, I was discharged from uh, the Air Force with an honorable discharge. And uh, the ribbons I had, were, I had a uh, European theater, American theater, and a good conduct uh, ribbon. And the funny thing about the good conduct, good, good conduct medal, uh, three times I was called forward from my uh, uh, squadron to receive this medal. I said, sir, I'm good, but I don't think I'm that good that I'm getting three uh, uh, good conduct medals. <laughs> and he just laughed and says, somebody's making a mistake. And uh, now the reason why I got the European theater uh, was that we flew out past the 12 mile limit with the B-29s. Uh, we we're supposed to be chasing some subs, but we couldn't go slow enough. All we could do was drop depth charges and hope it, it uh, got rid of the German subs that were off the coast. Uh, one incident that I forgot was when I was in Miami Beach, I was on guard duty one night and we were supposed to be on four hours and four hours off. And every time I came back to my checkpoint, I would hire a corporal of the guards, but nobody would answer me. And I spent not four hours, but from, uh, I think it was eight o'clock to eight o'clock the next morning. And finally, the corporal in charge of changing guards showed up. And he looked at me, he says, you passed the test. I said, what do you mean I passed the test? He says, if you had left, you'd be court-martialed. He says, but thank goodness you did. And uh, another incident that happened there on Miami Beach, just before we got there, uh, there was uh, three or four German spies that came ashore, and of course they were captured. and. Uh, it was strange because uh, after that, everybody was kind of uh, 
well, I should say, on the alert. And, uh, and it was awful because when you walk past the beach, there'd be pilings out there, and you swear that one of the pilings moved. And, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, it, it didn't happen. Another incident happened, and a uh, woman in Delaware, we had, no, it wasn't in Wilton, Delaware, it was in Amarillo. Uh, we had a night fighter we called a Black Widow that was on our, uh, at uh, our field. And only two of us, Albert Kenfield and myself, were allowed to do any maintenance on it. And they had a guard station on it. And Albert Kenfield and myself were in town on a Saturday at a bowling alley. And lo and behold, this young woman got it, uh, got to talking to Albert Kenfield and she started asking questions about the Black Widow. Well, nobody was supposed to know it was even out there. And so I got a hold of Albert Kenfield if, while we were bowling and told him, come with me. And we went in the men's room and I told him, you keep talking to her. I'm calling the field and calling my adjutant and tell them what's going on. And so Albert kept, I said, don't give her any of the, the technical information, just give her general information to everybody they could pick up out of a magazine. And so he did. And I called out there and lo and behold, while we were bowling, from every door and every alley came uh, men with drawn pistols and they arrested the woman and the three men there, and uh, I tried to get the, to tell me, let, asked them if they would give me the information what happened to them, but I never did find out. They arrested them, and what happened to them, I do not know. You told me about a incident, I think it was in Amarillo, um, where you had an incident in a B-17. Oh, uh, all right. Oh, when you, uh, the mechanics work on an aircraft, they never know when they're going to be told they're going to uh, take that a ride in that plane. And we, uh, one day we were called to go up in the plane, and lo and behold, uh, we were all in the plane, and uh, the captain, uh, there was an officer in charge of the plane. Uh, I was in the bombardier's uh, compartment and for some reason or the other I put the earphones on. I could hear him talking to the field when we were coming in for a landing and uh, calling for emergency uh, landing because his hydraulic system uh, wasn't working properly. And uh, uh, lo and behold I made my way up to the uh, uh, flight com uh, compartment and uh, there was one uh, as we came in for a landing uh, the co-pilot was hanging on to the emergency brake and the pilot was pushing on the regular brake system well there's a shuttle valve between the two systems and if you try to work both of them at the same time, it sticks in the middle and no, no, the hydraulic systems don't work. And I hollered to my buddy, uh, Shorty, and he was six foot four, <laughs> and with the name of Shorty, kicked the co-pilot, and he kicked the co-pilot and broke him, uh, or the pilot, I should say, and broke him loose from the, the emergency, uh, uh, no, it was a co-pilot, I'm sorry, and uh, emergency, and by the time the plane braked and stopped, we were already at the end of the runway and through the fence and onto the main highway. Fortunately, we hit no cars, but we were stopped. And so in the interrogation, uh, they asked us a question, and I said, pilot error, and I explained why. I said, if they had called our attention to it, 
we could have put chutes out through the uh, 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 the gunner's uh, windows and uh, that would put a drag on the plane slow down and the tail gunner could put out his chute and give us more re resistance and uh, I said and besides that they should have known better than try to be pulling on boat systems at the same time and whatever happened to the uh, uh, the pilot and the co-pilot I do not know <laughs> oh well, there was another incident we were on a this one fellow was kind of weird. He, uh, in the Air Force, we had signs up as saying, uh, if you get sunburn while you're working, the Air Force will take care of you. But if you get sunburn on your own, you still have to work. And this crazy kid, for some reason or another, is laying out on the uh, boardwalk that we use to run between the bars because of rain and taking this sunbath and I says and I looked at him and I told him I said hey if you stay over 15 minutes you're gonna cook and he wouldn't listen to me and he got sunburned real bad and uh, he was forced to work anyway and but the same individual when we were he was working on an aircraft and we went up for a flight uh, because it was their time to go through the uh, flight because of working on the aircraft and we don't know why he did it but for some crazy reason or the other he opened the rear compartment door and jumped out and with a parachute and <laughs> I called uh, up to the pilot and says we lost the student he says you what and we lost the student I says some crazy kid just jumped out and he said I was wondering what that drag on the plane was because with the door open the door was gone it was causing a little problem for him to fly well that he landed uh, safely on the ground and for some reason or the other he came across a couple of sheep and he thought they were having a problem uh, thirsty so he cuts their throat <laughs> and kills him and when uh, he got back to the uh, field the next day he was shipped out in basic uh, and sent to basic training again and he was shipped overseas <laughs> uh, but that was a weird incident <laughs> uh, never had it happen before with all the students we had did you ever have any um incidents when you were on guard duty in Miami? Uh, only a in funny incident was I was on guard duty and at 8 o'clock in the morning no it wasn't, it wasn't in Miami it was at uh, Washington University and these girls were having a meeting at the sorority house and here comes 100 girls and they weren't supposed to come on our uh, uh, part of the field uh, part of the grounds of the, the campus and what could I do with a wooden gun and a hundred girls coming at me I just let them go by <laughs> but that uh, was the only thing no the only or uh, I didn't have an incident but there was a another guard duty and when you come back you march you you meet together and then you go your I think it was a mile if I remember right and uh, then you come back again and but you have to challenge each other because you don't know who it is it's, sometimes it's pitch dark out there and they came back together and whether or not the, the fellow just figured he was just joking when he, when this other guard says stop or i'll shoot halt or i'll shoot and he refu didn't stop and he said it three times and the third time he stood the bolt home and shot and killed him and of course the next day uh, or when the, they brought the incident up uh, they fined him uh, so many dollars and gave him two cartons of cigarettes and shipped him off to a field and he could never be tried again in a civilian court uh, for murder <laughs> But that's the only incident that I know about that 
anybody got hurt. And, uh, what, what was the toughest thing you ever had to do while you were with the military? Toughest? Oh. Well, uh, when I was at Washington University, remember I just had my appendix taken out and uh, I was ordered to go over the optical course. And I tried, I said, sir, I can't. He says, yes, you can. And he wouldn't give me permission to talk. And so I went over the optical course. And when I got to the wall that you had to jump up and grab and swing yourself over, all I remember is I jumped up, grabbed the wall, but I, I blanked out. When I woke up, I was in the hospital at Washington University. And uh, of course, uh, I don't know what happened to him, but he was reprimanded real bad because he should have gave me uh, permission to talk. But that was one of the toughest things, going through that with my appendix uh, taken out and me recovering it from it. Uh, anything else? Oh, basic training. When we went through the infiltration course and uh, we had to crawl and they had live fire and we got to this one log and if we got over the log it was so big that it, well, our pants would have got creased with the bullets. Or, uh, uh, so what happened is several of the fellows got on each end of the log and lifted the log up and we crawled under the log mm. and that way we didn't get any incident. Uh, the, the week before uh, one of the uh, officers that was going through that course himself, as he was going through the course, uh, he ran across a rattlesnake and he grabbed it and held on it so tight the rattlesnake was strangled to death, but it quit, kept him from getting bit. <laughs> but you can imagine if facing a rattlesnake and going through that, and if you jump up, you're going to get shot. <laughs> But uh, that's the only incidents I know that happened there. Uh, trying to think. So many years ago. Uh, Do you think you ever got treated uh, differently or poorly because of your Italian heritage and because you were fighting the Italians? No, no. Uh, uh, we we were all treated quite well, except for the court marshals because they thought I had falsified. But uh, uh, yeah, that's why I asked because you you were almost court martialed what three or four times. Yeah, uh, well two times I got court martialed. Uh, uh, the third time I never it never got to that stage. Oh, a funny thing happened. To, uh, one of the fellows in the, was, well, maybe I shouldn't say this one. <laughs> he he was goosey, and and, and uh, if you did it, he go went berserk, and uh, I accidentally did it to him, and he uh, uh, he started chasing me, and I was running around the barracks. Well, somebody had strung uh, a wire between the guidelines and uh, the barracks to hang their laundry on it and it came running down full speed ahead and the next thing I know I was waking up and looking up and there was Randolph looking down at me and saying Len, Len, oh, no, he was calling me Ray, Ray, Ray wake up, wake up, I didn't mean to do anything to you and I looked up at him and I said I'm okay, I'm just, my throat's just a little sore and uh, uh, but the uh, it could have been serious. <laughs> it could have strangled myself. But uh, <laughs> that was one of the funny incidents that happened. Uh, oh, when I, our first day at uh, Fort Dix, I'll never forget it. Uh, I was used to being away from home as a Boy Scout. I had gone to camp several times, and but some of these fellows had never been away from home and you could hear them all crying and the sergeant in charge of the barracks was going around trying to console them 
but uh, it was grown men. We were actually young boys, 18 years old, <laughs> and uh, but missing home. <laughs> I was fortunate uh, that the 100 fellows that went with me and that they made the flight crews on the B-17s. In the first B-17s that went overseas, uh, didn't have any firepower on them. And uh, in fact, some of them cut holes in the back and mounted a machine gun to, uh, to, for a rear gunner. But they had to be very careful that they didn't, when they came to the dorsal fin, they didn't shoot their own plane down. And, uh, but most of them never came back. The first bunch of fellows that went over and it was terrible. But then they developed the uh, ball turrets and the chin turrets and the tail gunners and the uh, uh, top turrets. And uh, there was one uh, B-29 that I wanted to get assigned to. It uh, had more gunpowder than any plane and it was used as a decoy and uh, they would let smoke go out and like they were uh, injured and uh, I never flew it but I would love to uh, if I had gone overseas. Uh, uh, one gunner could call and have uh, I think it was 17 machine guns firing at the same plane at the same time. And wow, what power! <laughs> when I was stationed uh, at Amarillo, oh no, oh, when I was shipped to Amarillo, I we had a uh, couple of days extra, so we went to a, a hotel and stayed there overnight. And the next morning we came down to eat breakfast, and uh, we were sitting there eating our breakfast and, and called the young girl over to waitress and asked for our check and she says there is no check that's what he's talking about she says you see that man walking out to that cadillac out there you remind him of your his son and you and your buddies are all paid for wherever you eat in this hotel or whatever you do drink in this hotel is free and uh, we're not allowed to accept any tips that's been taken care of too. So that was my introduction to uh, uh, Amarillo. And uh, I, in fact, the newspapers, uh, 100 of us came there and uh, at the same time. And we were adopted by the uh, Amarillo uh, as Texans, which was made us feel pretty good. <laughs> oh, uh, another strange thing happened at Washington University. We were standing out in front uh, uh, at attention and it started to snow and there was 400 of us standing in line. Each line was 100 men and the first three lines were all Southerners. You know, the, uh, the last line was all Yankees and they went berserk. They had never seen snow before. And they start broke ranks and throwing snowballs and everything else. And of course, the sergeant in charge called them to attention and took them off on double time running. And one of us were allowed to go into the mess hall. And the, the, the cooks and the waitresses said, what are we gonna do? We got all this food prepared. I said, we'll eat as much as we can, but we can't eat it all. <laughs> but it was funny <laughs> because uh, they, they had never seen snow before in their lives. And of course, it was weird. <laughs> oh my, so many years ago. And I was thinking of some of the fellows and wondering if they ever, who they were and where they went. Uh, that graduated and flew, did they ever come back? That's about it.
All right. Well, uh, on behalf of the Military Education Preservation Project, uh, thank you for your service. And uh, thank you for your time and your willingness to share your experiences with us.